Hello, I'm Jonathan Bowman Perks, and welcome to my favourite time of the week. And as part of the Inspiring Leadership series, I'm very fortunate to have Air Marshal uh, Sir Graham Stacey uh, from the Royal Air Force. He has a very distinguished career. You can look him up on Wikipedia uh, and on LinkedIn. Uh, a huge amount of experience as a almost like an infantry officer but in the Royal Air Force, defending airfields. He's served in all sorts of operations, from Iraq to Afghanistan and uh, Kosovo. And I've really enjoyed our conversation that we've had before this series. But I'm, I really want to hear, Graham, a little bit about uh, yourself. We, we met again at Staff College recently. We, we, uh, we knew each other 25 years ago. Uh, great experience you've had, three star um, in the Royal Air Force, now you're going into business. Um, what about some of your experiences and some of the sort of defining moments? No, and, and you know, it's a great pleasure for me as well to you know join up with you again and, and be doing this. And, and you know, defining moments. Uh, I, you know, I'm a very fortunate person in many ways. I think I've had a life full of, of defining moments. Um, you, you know, I, I joined the RAF regiment. Um, I was very quickly, as many of us are in, in those sort of roles, um, you know, commanding a 21 year old boy, um, commanding 38 grizzly experienced soldiers. Um, that went well. I loved it. Um, I love looking after people. Um, I very quickly got a reputation for being willing, able, um, and actually enthusiastic about doing odd jobs, the different yeah. jobs, the unusual jobs. Um, that took me to loan service with the Indonesian Army. It took me to Northern Ireland working for the Defence Research Agency. Uh, and then I guess my most defining moment, the big career change for me, was it took me to Bosnia to join the personal staff of Carl Bildt yeah, um, just sure. after the Dayton Agreement. What, what a character he was. And I mean, I, I suppose in our conversation you were saying that, you know, I love that point you're making about inspiring leaders come in all shapes yeah. and sizes and genders and backgrounds. What was, what was yeah, your point and, and, and you know, we, as we were talking about, I mean, you, you know, was Carl Bildt an inspiring leader? Well, I, I certainly thought he was. But probably not, you know, the first time you met him or you saw him across the room, you weren't bowled over by, gosh, who's that? Um, he's quite unassuming, um, he, he, he's quite quiet, um, but, but he's got an intellect the size of a planet and, and he can really hold uh, a room, a conversation, a meeting, and, and we're not talking about small meetings, we're talking about heads of state, government, UN meetings. Um, so so he, he, he was um, um, truly inspiring, but it, but it did confirm, and I think my whole career has confirmed, a, a very strong belief that you know, leaders come in every shape, every size, every gender, every background. And I think quite often we make a mistake of, of having this sort of poster image of, yeah. of what, a, what, what a leader must be like. And my advice to, to young leaders is, is be you. Yeah. Don't be what you think the poster wants you to be. Correct. Right. Uh, and, and you were talking about another inspiring leader when you were at Kabul, weren't you? Yeah, and, and, and it goes back to, you know, before this conversation, I was, I was going through my head. Who, who's really impacted on me? And... Um, and one of them that came to mind immediately was a, a, a fantastic young officer, uh, an amazing young woman um, who I had the pleasure of commanding in, in Kabul, running one of the busiest airfields in the world at the time, high threat environment, complex, um, challenging in so many ways. Um, she ran my airfield operations. She ran the loading and unloading of aircraft. High pressure, um, time sensitive, dangerous, a multinational team working under her command. Um, but her enthusiasm, her willingness, her inspiration, her energy, her humour, Paula. Yeah. Um, and, and Paula is, has been with me uh, as, as I've learned from her, um, but, but I've also looked for other Paulas yeah. and inspired others to, to be what she could be. Um, and, you, you know, uh, yeah, quite amazing. And, and then when you get to the other extreme, um, you know, I've worked for some amazing military leaders, uh, and going back to the other, you know, the other end of the spectrum, the the sort of world, um, world renowned leaders. Um, and yeah, the American you mentioned. Know, yeah, I mean, I you know, I've 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 worked for many of the greats, of Brits uh, and um, and Americans, uh, and I, I think I would probably choose at, at the moment Joe Dunford, General Joe Dunford. Um, he's the outgoing chairman of the Joint Chiefs, so he's the Chief of Defence of the United States. That's a pretty big job yep. in its own right. Um, I, I've known Joe a number of years. Uh, I've worked closely with him. I've attended courses with him. Well, we've become friends. And, and I just find him a, an amazing character because he, he's quiet. Um, he will listen. Um, he will consider your views. 
Um, he treats every person like they're special. Um, he's got an amazing political and diplomatic antenna, mm. which of course he needs in his current role. Um, he can be decisive. He, 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 he can be you know, forceful. He's a US Marine. Um, with huge combat experience. Uh, he can do all those if, if they're required and when they're required, he does them. But, but I think what, why I, I'm so inspired by, by Joe Dunford and people like him, I think they epitomize to me um, the blend that modern society needs of, of the soldier, the diplomat, the philosopher, the mm -hmm. statesperson. And, and to be able to do it with dignity, with humility, and with a genuine interest in people in the most difficult of circumstances, politically and security-wise, um, just amazing. Well, well, it is interesting, we often say we admire in others certain qualities that we have in ourselves equally as we are critical of qualities yeah, in other true. people which actually are qualities we have ourselves. When you're pointing your finger at someone, there's three fingers pointing back at you. Uh, and people do say that you've got this, this wonderful breadth of experience, international experience, that you've had to work with difficult, difficult individuals, different nations uh, and diplomacy where you don't have you can't just tell them to do it because they're another nation and this is what many of the CEOs and leaders yeah. that I'm working with have the same problem they're in a matrix organization take something like HSBC different countries different people around the world in different sectors and you have to influence and persuade without authority over them but I wanted you to go on and talk then about uh, I always find it most interesting um, which is in the last couple of minutes but the mistakes, uh, or a mistake that you've made, and what you learned from it. Do you want yeah. to just share the story of that one? I, I think I will, and I, I think the way I'd approach it. I mean, the first thing I would say is that that I, I learn every single day, yeah. and I think I, I'm not, I'm deeply suspicious of people who just have stopped learning because I I learn every day, and, and I think the inference for that is I try and improve every day. Well, yeah. clearly, if you're improving, then you're trying to fix something or build on something. So, so I, I, you know, mistakes are. Um, I, I try not to make them. I, I don't go out to make them, but, but I certainly uh, you know, have made a few. I think the example I choose would be um, when I commanded Cyprus. So we're talking about a two-star command, large, complex organization, over 3,000 people spread over an area. Um, and I had one unit commander under my command who, who, who was struggling. Uh, and we knew he was struggling, uh, and we were trying to assist, but it became very clear um, that in his struggles, bullying, harassment, inappropriate treatment of subordinates was coming out by him. Um, now this was complicated by the fact that, that he was at the very end of, of a 39 year distinguished career, literally in his last four months. Um, and so against my better judgment, um, it was proposed to me that, that we give him a dignified way out, a, a, a sort of rather than you know, go in with the full might of a formal investigation and, and formally suspend him, we administratively move him, we allow him, like I say, leave with honour, replace him, stop the problem immediately, but, but give him uh, yeah. a way out. Um, unfortunately, um, he didn't take it that way. Um, he took it exactly the opposite. It, he felt that if there was a case against him, we would have used it. Uh, and in turn, he accused me and many of my staff of bullying, made formal complaints against us, raised service complaints, all of which were completely disproven because the facts were clear to say. Um, but at the end of the day, it caused a lot of this bad feeling, he caused a lot of bad feeling. A lot of my energy, a lot of the energy of my team were absorbed in dealing with this case, which shouldn't have happened. Yeah. Um, so what did it tell me? So you're learning. Go with your instinct. Yeah. I mean, it, it, if it smells like you ought to take the type of action, take it. Um, and the other thing is, a long time ago, someone once told me that, that certain misery is always better than the misery of uncertainty. So, so attack a problem early. Don't kick the can down the road. Yeah. Do what's right and attack a problem that way. My, my learning thing was it doesn't really matter if you're in your last day of service or your first day of service, you get the same treatment. Yeah. 